welcome everyone to Berkeley Unbound, the Bay Area Book Festival's day-long mini-fest of big ideas, ideas that grapple with this epic time of crisis and possibility. How communities will reshape themselves and be reshaped by outside forces is what is on the table. I'm Davia Nelson, half of NPR's Kitchen Sisters, producers of the Hidden Kitchen series heard on Morning Edition, and I'll be your moderator for this conversation entitled Food is Fundamental. Joining me are two of the most revolutionary food activists in the Bay Area, dare I say, the nation, outspoken mavericks, force fields, both. Saru Jayaraman is the co-editor of the new book, Bite Back, People Taking on Corporate Food and Winning, director of UC Berkeley's Food Labor Research Center, co-founder of the Restaurant Opportunity Center United, and president of One Fair Wage. Alice Waters is the founder of Berkeley's own Chez Panisse, now in its 49th year, and the Edible Schoolyard Project, now in its 25th year, a program that has ignited a network of some 7,000 edible education projects around the world. Alice is also the author of some 17 books including her upcoming manifesto about the power of food and a recipient of the National Medal of Honor from President Barack Obama. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Alice, let's start with you. If food is fundamental, what is the burning issue to you now? I think that we have a silver lining possibility because we do all eat. We all eat. And we have the possibility of eating with intention. We could buy our food from the industrial food system or we could buy our food from a farmer's market. We could grow our food. We could connect with the farmers who take care of the land and their farm workers. And we could say, I want to buy directly from you. You know, at the beginning of Shebanis, I was looking for taste. I, I couldn't find the food that tasted like the food I had eaten in France. This was back in 1971. And it led me to search for what was growing in and around the Bay Area. And at the first thing we did was to go to farm stands. And when you buy the food directly from the farmer, it doesn't cost as much because there isn't a retail <laughs> uh, component to it where the distributor is taking the money. So we would go to the farm stand and we would buy the corn in the fall. I remember those days. And then ultimately we ended up at the doorsteps of, of the organic farming movement in Northern California. And we knew that the best tasting food was the food that was seasonally ripe. It was also the most affordable. So that's where we went. We went and got Masamoto's peaches <laughs> and we brought them to the restaurant. And it was amazing when we served those People would say, where did you get that peach? It's so delicious. And again, making that connection of farm to table. Now, I don't know whether I answered your question. I think but, you did, but I'm wondering, so it, there's the founding and those first early farmer stands and fruit trees and play that forward into the now. Here we are. Okay. In six months into the pandemic, so many of the food chains and food supply things have been completely disrupted. The health, everyone's health is at stake. You've been thinking about this, uh, these issues for decades now. 
what has been the burning ember? Well, the real shocking part is the fact that the industrial food system has been exposed. They're in it for the money. So if they don't want to buy the feed for their animals rather than give the animals to people who are hungry, they just got rid of the animals. They shot them and buried them. And this was a real, a real moment in the pandemic for I think everybody who lived in this country. They just saw that happening on the front page of the New York Times. And you, you see the people who are struggling to find something to eat. And it's, it's happening all around that we're worried about our food security. And we've never really been worried before in this way. Maybe during the Depression, we were worried. I know my parents were worried during World War II, and it's the reason they planted a victory garden at their home. And we ate out of that victory garden growing up. My mother would can the food for the winter. We ate only in season. As I always say, it would have been great if she had been a good cook, <laughs> but she knew nothing about cooking of food. But that is a place that we have never been trained as, uh, as a country. Yes, there are pockets uh, of people, particularly in the South, but we found them when we all went to Tennessee and we cooked with the chefs there for Al Gore's Climate Underground Conference. And I found that they had five different kinds of beans I had never heard of before. And they knew how to cook greens so beautifully. And I, I was, again, surprised by the biodiversity, the local biodiversity, the traditions of food that exist in, the, in this country. But in 50, 60 years of fast food uh, indoctrination, We've forgotten about it. And this pandemic has brought it back to us in, in a way that, that we want to know what's nearby. We, we, we want to help the people who need the food in our communities. We're trying to think of everywhere we can plant food. And I know that that's happening in Stockton right now. There's a project, uh, the mayor of Stockton asked us if we could help connect the organic farmers um, with food boxes that could be given to people who needed it in Stockton. And we found a philanthropist who helped us to do that. Well, what could be better than the people who need it the most to get the healthiest food? But it's also exposed the whole, uh, the whole health system, big time. And the people who are the most vulnerable because of the poor diets around fast food are the ones who are most susceptible to the pandemic. And it's really a moment that, that we need to pay attention to what we're eating. And I'm going to bring how we're eating. <laughs> how we're eating. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm going to bring Sarah in here. Sarah, you have such an astounding overview of the food industry, of the lives of people who work in food and in restaurants. You've devoted yourself to the well-being and the 
and fairness, those issues. What is the burning issue if food is fundamental right now? What is the burning issue to you? And we'll fan out both of you to discuss not just the burning issue, but so many of them, where we yeah. are, where we need to go, where we've been, where we're headed. Yeah, I mean, there's so much, so much I could talk about, but I think the burning issue for uh, literally millions of workers right now in at least the restaurant industry, you know, for any part of the food system that you think there are essential workers, those essential workers are suffering. Um, and the restaurant industry is the largest of the food labor system. Uh, and we, in a lot of states, um, there is this absurd minimum wage of $2.13 that exists, 43 states, not in California, but in a lot of the country that was an issue before the pandemic. The burning issue right now is that a lot of those states that pay these workers $2 are reopening uh, at 25 or 50% capacity and asking workers to come back, risk their lives for a $2 wage when tips are down 50 to 75%, and they're being asked to enforce social distancing and mask rules with the very same customers from whom they're supposed to get tips to make up their minimum wage. It's an impossible situation. It's a public health disaster for the workers you know, either they're going to enforce these rules and not get tips and face the kind of food insecurity that Alice is talking about. I can't tell you the number, literally thousands of workers that are telling us, I don't have money for gas to get to the food bank. When I get to the food bank, there's no food, it's spoiled or it's gone. I've had people telling me I am now stealing food from my children because I have no other way to feed my children. These are, these are food service workers. These are people whose lives have been about serving us food are not able to feed their children in this moment. So either they're going to enforce those rules because they're told they have to and uh, not get tips, or they're not going to enforce the rules so that they can get tips and feed their kids. It's an impossible choice and it's going to lead to a public health disaster either way. And so the burning issue continues to be, it was before the pandemic and it continues to be, how can we pay the largest workforce in America $2 an hour? It was never acceptable. And now it's literally a matter of life and death, literally. Sorry, oh, was, just, no, I just no, no, no. wanted to say something about that because this is all about food being cheap, fast, cheap, and easy. And in order for food to be cheap, the only way is to buy food that's industrially produced. And secondly, not to pay the people who are preparing it or serving it. And that's why the food is cheap. Now, since the beginning of time, food has always been considered precious. Don't waste any little thing save everything you know i always think of of jose andres when i say that because he said you know you buy an expensive organic chicken uh, i th think i can make four meals out of it he can make six mm -hmm. <laughs> you know if you know how to cook but but the thing is is the fast food industry has made money on uh, taking advantage of the, the cheap price and enticing people to buy that food because it's cheap. And we need to really expose that right now for what it is. It's all wrong. It's all wrong. Yeah. Saro, can you lay out for people who might not know, I spoke with you a few months back towards the early days of the pandemic and it was during the time when people were actually getting unemployment uh, in those early days. And you were explaining the situation with a lot of restaurant people and what those conditions were. Can you do a quick sketch of that so people listening can have a sense of what people have been going through? And, what and, the, and unfortunately, the ongoing situation, um, Oh, it's so before the pandemic, 
there were 13.6 million restaurant workers. Um, it was the nation's largest and fastest growing private sector workforce, but also the absolute lowest paying. And that was largely due to this absurd wage, the federal minimum wage of $2.13 an hour, which is a literal legacy of slavery. It originates from restaurant owners after emancipation, not wanting to pay workers a minimum wage, not wanting to pay black people a wage, having them live on tips instead, which was a mutation of the original concept of tipping. Tipping came from Europe where it was intended to be an extra or bonus on top of the wage. Slavery changed it into a replacement for a wage for a mostly black female population. And that became law in 1938 as part of the New Deal, which said you get the minimum wage except for tipped workers, you get zero dollars as long as tips bring you to the full minimum wage. We went from zero in 1938 to $2.13 an hour, which was the wage, which is the wage today and was the wage before the pandemic. And before the pandemic, it was a source of economic instability and sexual harassment for still a mostly female population of waitresses and bartenders and casual restaurants across America. Well, with the pandemic, about 10 million of those 13.6 million workers lost their jobs. And We've done a lot of research. We started a fund. We raised like $23 million for these workers. 220,000 workers applied for relief. And 60% of them, 60% were unable to access unemployment insurance, not because of immigration status. That was a sliver of people. The vast majority of folks across the country were told that their wages and tips were too low to qualify for benefits that they had paid taxes to receive. So it was such a slap in the face because these were states that refused to raise these workers' wages and then turned around and told them with the pandemic, well, because we didn't raise your wage, you cannot now get benefits because your wages are too low to meet the minimum threshold. And that resulted in literally mass starvation, evictions, homelessness, I'm sure you've seen, there are so many press reports now of restaurant workers living in parks mm -hmm. in, across the country. Um, you know, inability to pay utilities and heat in other states. Winter is coming and without heat, people are going to die. I don't know if people understand. People are going to die. Uh, and, they, and, and they can't feed their kids. They literally cannot feed their kids. And that has been an ongoing situation. When you compound on top of that, this incredibly impossible choice. Either you take this $2 job and risk your life going to try to police customers on social distancing and masks while you're trying to get tips from them, or you refuse the job and you don't get to keep your benefits, if you got benefits. Because unemployment insurance was set up since the 30s. It was set up to encourage people to take any low-wage job that came your way. And so that means you are forced, you are forced to take that job, otherwise you lose your benefits. Now think about all the restaurant workers with pre-existing conditions or health, you know, risks. Um, you know, I, I talked to a restaurant worker today whose mother died of COVID while he was working a 12 hour shift in a restaurant. These are communities of color with very high risk of everything from diabetes to all kinds of health conditions. But they're being told, if you don't take that job, we don't care about your health situation. If you don't take that job, go back to work for a $2 wage, you will lose any benefits that you got. Because most of those workers who were denied unemployment insurance by their states, some of them were able to get the $600 from the federal government, which then disappeared and has not come back. Um, and so here you are with this very impossible choice. I'm going to risk my life and my family's life or I lose my benefits. There is no good option there. And I just don't think people understand the scale or the intensity and severity of the destitution we're seeing and about to see even more of. Alice, as you're listening to Sarah, what is, what's going through your head? What is going through my head? A massive strike. <laughs> A just a massive strike. Every restaurant tour needs to just say, no, we can't, we, we won't open up our restaurants. Well, we have to be sort of in solidarity. That was what was going through my head, uh, truly. Because uh, I mean, we're, 
in a very vulnerable situation too. Um, I mean, we're very lucky that we have all these years of wonderful clients who support us no matter what, and we're trying to get food to them, and we're trying to social distance and all of the above. But whether we can keep it together and sell enough food so that when we do open up, when, when we're able to, that we'll have the staff to do it. And um, but but to think about that kind of of low wage is is kind of unbelievable to me, and um, it's kind of unbelievable also uh, to think about the food that children are being served at schools, and of course without school, there's no food for the kids. And that's something that we're scrambling to take care of in Berkeley. But I'm just thinking about all around the country that um, children don't even have that free or reduced lunch of fast food. But it's a time when I think we need to make decisions about how to feed all children free healthy school lunches every single day. And when we open up, we need to be prepared to do that. We really need to consider food and the values that come with that food. What we are teaching our children and a stewardship and equality and nourishment are key to that. How the food is grown is a big part of it. And I'm looking for leadership from the University of California. I am. There we have a very big buyer of food. And what if they purchase their food with discernment? What if they decided that they would support all the small farmers who take care of the land? It would put young people back into farming, put young people into farming. What if we paid farm workers the real cost? What if we bought directly from the farms like we do at Chez Panisse. What if the University of California did that? Not just UC Berkeley, but the entire- I'm not talking UC Berkeley. I'm talking about every, every campus. It could be an incredible, stable buyer. It could connect all of the students with the farms. I mean, that's what happened with Chez Panisse. We, we would go out to the farm and pick up the food. And it was a real education in regenerative farming. And we ended up really learning so much, learning how to cook differently at the restaurant and completely seasonally. But the university is such a resource of research <laughs> and, and a kind of, I mean, can you imagine that regenerative organic food could repair our immune systems, that it's good for our health and it's good for the health of the planet. It directly pulls the carbon down and it, uh, uh, um, it restores climate. And I, I don't know, I, I'm very hopeful in that place because it's a chain around the state of California. And I guess I'm really was um, in Berkeley at the right time in the 60s. And I felt the, the power of demonstrating at that point, the hope that we had, the hope of stopping the war in Vietnam, 
the hope that we could really address civil rights. The hope that, that the university could provide free speech for everybody. And we accomplished a lot. And we did that together. And I've never lost my hope since then. So that's where I'm going. I'm going to the place of education, which I think is our last truly democratic institution. It's all children go to school or should. And I'm afraid our schools have been industrialized like our farms. And we need to make an intervention right through the cafeteria door. We need to come in with the values that are so fundamental to humanity. Come in with that beauty of ripe food. Come in with the diversity of ingredients come in with a sense of nourishment and an appreciation. We'll become grateful to the people who bring us our food. Saru, you have such a an organizer's mind, an advocate's mind, a systemic mind on how to implement campaigns, on how to bring one fair wage, on all these kinds of things. So having just heard what Alice said, so she has the vision for using the UC system as an economic engine, connecting the universities to farms within the radius of that, supporting healthy uh, farms, things that are good for the climate, regenerative agriculture, you with your mind, how would you implement that? How, if Alice said, Saru, can help me implement this, what, what are the first things that come to your mind hearing that vision, hearing that mission? I just think that this crisis has created such an opportunity to push for a really transformative change at all levels. Like, you know, just on that question, I would say, uh, let's elevate the crisis that children are facing without being able to access food right now. Let's elevate the crisis of um, children even in the Bay Area or around UC campuses that are not able to access food. Um, I mean, I know my children's public school was shut down and they're replacing it with a charter school. So there's that whole element, you know, there's, there's, there's real, there's corporate food and there's corporate education trying to impede on the public school system. And mm -hmm. the UC system could definitely play a role in mm -hmm. changing all of that. So I, I think elevating the crisis is the way that I would go about doing it. Um, I think that's true on these broader issues, even beyond the UC system in the food system in America. I think elevating the crisis that all workers in the food system are facing, whether they're in the meat packing plants and they're processing the meat that gets to our tables or they're the farm workers suffering with really high late rates of COVID and coronavirus or they're the restaurant workers trying to <laughs> enforce social distancing on a $2 wage. There's an opportunity right now, obviously even that word essential, there's an, a new awareness among consumers that these workers are essential. We couldn't live without them. Um, and so I think it's time to really push on that awareness. I think also it's time to lift up the silver linings. Alice mentioned silver lining. I think there's real silver linings. Alice is one of the silver linings <laughs> because she is one of many restaurant owners that have said, like she just said, things have to change for workers and for employers at the same time. And so I just wanted to lift up, we've been having this extraordinary moment where restaurant owners who fought us on raising wages in the past, about two or 300 of them have come over to our side in the last several months. Whoa. Yeah, during the pandemic and as okay. a result of the murder of George Floyd have come mm -hmm. to us and said, it's, it's time to end this legacy of slavery. It's time to end this $2 wage. And so we have created these unity deals in New York. We're going to Governor Cuomo together, employers and workers, and saying that we came together in a crisis and we're demanding change. And we're doing that in multiple states. 
and at the federal level, we are going to Congress together and saying, for God's sakes, if we as independent restaurants and workers who are typically on either sides of the aisle, if we can come together and say we need both the Restaurants Act, which would provide relief to restaurants, and the Raise the Wage Act, which would provide a $15 minimum wage and an and elimination of the subminimum wage, we need both. We need protection for workers and relief for employers. If we can come together around that, why can't our elected officials, our leadership, reach an agreement that would bring back the $600 unemployment insurance, would bring back stimulus, would bring back relief for restaurants that are on the verge of closing? I'm sure everybody's heard the data that we're, we may lose anywhere between 50 and 85% of independent restaurants through this pandemic. And I I think that's so horrific, and it's also important to know another data point when you hear that data point is that also means 50 to 85 percent of low-wage workers who will be long-term unemployed. And so we need both long-term unemployment insurance, livable wages, and relief for restaurants. And we've found this way to bring rest independent restaurants and workers together to make these demands. We just need elected officials to listen in the same way we need the UC system <laughs> to listen. We need elected officials to listen to the people on the ground who not only know best and have been fighting on these issues forever, but have been willing to come together in really unique ways during this pandemic as a result of this pandemic and really kind of are the model for what legislators should be doing. They need to get over themselves. They need to get over partisan politics at this moment and realize we are in a massive crisis. And if we've learned nothing from the pandemic, it's that we're interdependent and we have to work together to save each other. The lowest wage worker in America, that person not having access to a vaccine, that will be an ongoing problem. It's not like we all get the vaccine and we're done. Until the lowest wage worker in America gets that vaccine, we're all at risk. Does that not teach us that we're all interdependent? You know, I, I have to say, I want, I want you to add to your list of things that we need real food. We need food that is grown regeneratively and organically. We're in a dress rehearsal right now for climate change. And if we don't change the way we eat, if we don't enrich the soil with the compost and pull that carbon down into the ground, we're going to be in a much more serious crisis than we are now. And so to, to band that group of restaurateurs together, to connect them to the farmers who are taking care of the land, to ask our public officials to really uh, demand that people consider what is food, what is nourishment about, what does it mean to grow food with chemicals and herbicides of all sorts? What does it mean? What's it doing to us? It's making us vulnerable for the pandemic. That's what it's doing to us. So why don't we take that on at this moment too? And I'd love to be part of that bigger conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think it's what could really be the mission of the University of California to put that word out in the world. But it's, it's and not only valuing people and their health <laughs> by paying them, but it's valuing the health of the land. And I think it all comes together that when you value the land, you begin to value all the people. You see the diversity. You, you fell in love with nature. And we have fallen out of love with nature, with this fast food indoctrination. And so we need to come back again. That's where the real nourishment is and beauty. So 
I always call it a delicious revolution <laughs> because I never think this is hard. I'm talking, I want meaningful work for people. I don't want restaurant people to be, you know, forced to work in the basements of restaurants and have to make food that they know is not healthy for people. I don't want that. I want us to find out that that feeding people is the most important job that anybody could have. And we want it, we, that, that's, that's really what it's about when a mother cooks for the family, sits down, maybe the kids start to learn how to cook, they'd cook together. And we've lost that. We've lost the family table. And we've lost the idea that food is precious. Yeah, I think um, we've lost the fam. We lost the family table before the pandemic. Now there's we not did. food to come together around. I had a mother write to us. Well, we had several mothers say, I'm, I'm out now stealing food for my children. But I had a mother write to me saying, how long do you expect me to go? I, a, I don't have gas to get to the food bank. When I get there, the only option to feed my children is bread and maple syrup. How long do you expect me to feed my child bread and maple syrup? You know? Well, that's why I'm saying, you know, the University of California is a land grant university. That's huge pieces of property over in Richmond, California. But it's a huge piece. I mean, maybe we could figure out how to plant food there, ultimately get the toxins out of the ground by planting a cover crop of fava beans like we did at the Edible Schoolyard in Berkeley. What if we planted food on all the school grounds? What if we planted food in every city park? What if we planted food and like Ron Finley's doing in the in the median, uh, the strips between the street and the sidewalk. How much food could we grow? And and what a it's like the Conservation Corps was during World War II. But we need help to get organized. But that the even the booklets that were passed out by the government during World War II would be perfect for right now because those were made for every area of the country, depending on the climate. And it showed you what you could plant and easily. And it's, it's like a hopeful scenario. I think about the homeless garden in Santa Cruz, and I'm sure you know about that garden. I mean, it's been so successful. It and started case, us, just for people listening that don't know what that garden is about, describe that. Well, it was started 30 years ago um, by a group that was uh, part of um, Alan Chadwick's uh, whole program at UC Santa Cruz, but it developed into a program for, for helping the homeless. And it's just grown and grown and grown. <laughs> and everybody who sort of leaves that garden ends up getting work in the tree core or in something related to gardening. But it's, it's been, it's my, my vision of a real success story. And I thought, why don't we plant down on the land in Berkeley, down by the water, down by the bay? Why isn't that a place that we could hire people that are homeless and they could grow food? There was a garden project that the San Francisco County Jail started by Catherine Sneed that inspired me to start the Edible Schoolyard Project 25 years ago. And the inmates grew on seven acres of the land in South San Francisco Jail at San Bruno. And by the time they got out, they wanted another place to grow food. So she started a halfway house garden outside the jail in South San Francisco. And they actually 
took the food to stands in San Francisco and sold them at the farmer's market. So, I mean, I know that growing food can be a really um, deeply regenerative, <laughs> transformational, I dare say transformational and that's why if you can do it in a jail you can do it in a school and all the students from santa cruz came in to help in the homeless garden volunteered to work in the homeless garden and so this this is a, a an amazing hopeful way of feeding ourselves and it could start tomorrow tomorrow so I want to ask you this, and then Alice, I'm going to ask you as well, if you were thinking about going forward, sort of a map forward, if you were to say three things that people could do to bring a more just, equitable, healthy, sustainable food system, food world, help people right now who don't have enough food, you know, you both have your deep concerns, which, what, uh, what are, let's start with three actions. You, your book, Bite Back, is a call to action. All kinds <laughs> of people who took situations where they saw deep issues and scandals and they bit back. So if people were to take a bite right now and take action, what would you suggest? Or yeah, I think three things I would suggest. One is, um, we worked with Governor Newsom here in California to launch a program called High Road Kitchens that provides grants to small independent restaurants throughout the state that commit to, we have a whole race and gender equity program to increase race and gender equity in restaurants. So they commit to going through that program and they commit to providing about 500 to 1,000 free meals. And so it, it, about 50 or 60 restaurants got grants, they signed up. It's a website called highroadkitchens.com. So in addition to supporting at a, uh, uh, Alice's restaurants, Chez Panisse and, and her programs, if you could go to that website and support those restaurants when you want to choose where to eat out, those are restaurants that have committed to increased wages and equity and to feeding people and have been recognized by the governor as doing so. So that, that's one thing I would say. The second thing is that, as Alice said, there's a lot moving in Congress right now besides the fact that we have a Senate that is moving absurdly fast to replace Justice Ginsburg. Um, we also have a Senate that has blocked both minimum wage increases and the Restaurants Act to provide relief to restaurants and the $600, you know, renewal of the $600. That's a lifeline to millions and millions of people. So I would ask that you call the Senate switchboard, which you can, you can look up right now, just Google Senate switchboard, mm -hmm. you get the number call the Senate switchboard and frankly, don't just call our California senators, call other senators and tell them uh, to stop playing partisan politics in the middle of a pandemic. And instead of trying to rush a, a nomination, why aren't they rushing relief to millions of people who need it? Uh, why aren't they rushing $600 unemployment insurance and relief for restaurants and a new food system, like Alice said? Why aren't they rushing to save us from a pandemic mm -hmm. that's already killed 200,000 Americans? We need to call our legislators. That's number two. Um, and number three, I mentioned we started this fund for workers. Um, as I said, 220,000 workers applied, 35 or 40,000 workers in California have come to us. Most are facing starvation and homelessness. If you can go to ofwemergencyfund.org and give um, and encourage other people to give, um, you know, we pay each worker a $500 cash payment and it allows them to buy groceries, um, just basic necessities. But it, it, it's a kind of a two or three for your value because when you give to that fund, you're not just giving direct relief. We're using those dollars and that fund to then 
bring workers together, collectivize their vo voices, register them to vote, get them to vote in this election. Um, and so there's a real voter engagement program that's connected to the emergency fund that is a part of when, when, what you get when you give. So ofwemergencyfund.org, that's the third thing I would say because people definitely need relief, but let's shape relief in a way that shapes a different future for all of us. Let's think about immediate relief in a way that frankly changes the food system and all the way Alice talked about and changes the way we treat people that bring us our food as well. And say again, Saru, the name of the fund where they, if people want to go contribute. www.ofw, like one fair wage, ofwemergencyfund.org. Deep, deep, deep. Alice, what about you? Three things, actions. <laughs> You're writing a manifesto about the power of food. What are three things you ask of people right now in this moment? Uh, certain, certainly everybody who can afford it should buy the food directly from those people in the farmers markets, in the restaurants who are supporting the network of organic regenerative local farms and ranchers. It's critical right now because all of these farmers have lost their, their restaurant customers right now. And so that's why we're focused on uh, uh, selling farm boxes at Chez Panis. And we're going to be open more days doing that because we want to include more farmers. And uh, that's something really, really crucial. And then I can't be any other place than in that plant a seed, plant a seed, plant a seed in a, in a flower box, plant a seed wherever you are. I mean, even if it doesn't grow well, you learn something and you can plant the right thing the next time, plant food, plant food. Um, plant trees, but plant food trees. And I know there's a big tree planting that's going on internationally and um, billions of trees to be planted for climate um, uh, restoring the climate. But um, it's very hard and I really appreciate, Saru, your letting us know exactly the places to give our money because I am bombarded by requests and I'm, I keep going back and giving to the people that I know, but I know that there are a lot of new people that are doing remarkable work. And uh, we, we really appreciate knowing where to give our money. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I think it's important that anybody who can speak up effectively needs to. That we need uh, all of the compassionate voices willing to take a stand saying, this is what I believe, <laughs> really, and, and be willing to take the consequences of that. Um, it's, it's critical. And I know at some point, we might really need to take that stand and, and risk our lives like other people have done for us. And um, it's Important for me most is that we really prepare that next generation, that we love them, that we take care of them. And maybe there are ways that we can help the poor parents who are trying to teach. Maybe we can help like with lessons from the edible schoolyard on how you can teach when you cook 
food for your children, how you can teach mathematics, how you can teach science, how you can teach history of making uh, food from the Middle East when you're studying that culture and you're making hummus and pita bread. Uh, you're learning and digesting the lessons thoroughly. So I think that these are all very important ways that we can really help right now. I want to bring this to a close, asking each of you uh, what you'd like to ask each other. Saru, <laughs> what would you like to ask Alice or what, what do you want to say to Alice? You two are just so powerful and visionaries moving down different tracks, but at the same time, very linked. How, what are you thinking or what would you like to in this moment? <laughs> Um, I, I think I'd like to say, Alice, we should talk. <laughs> yes. Let's follow up because uh, I do think there's a moment right now where, like I said, restaurant owners who haven't been open to wage issues are suddenly open and probably those same people are open to you, Alice, on issues of sourcing in a way that they may not have been in the past. Some, I think there's some of the same people who've been stubborn on these issues, recalcitrant, unwilling to move, are there's a new opening to move them. And so I think we should be working together to push them. I'll just give a quick example. We had kind of a huge victory on Friday. Um, so Alice keeps talking about the fast food world. I translate that in my book into what we call the other NRA. The National Restaurant Association represents the chain restaurants in America. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who have been around for 150 years since emancipation, demanding to keep wages at zero, one, two dollars an hour. Um, Herman Cain, who got a lot of attention and then passed away from COVID, um, he was the head of the other NRA back in 1995. He's the one who struck the deal with Congress that said, sure, we'll let the overall minimum wage go up as long as tipped workers are frozen at $2.13 an hour. So Herman Cain is responsible for that $2 wage right now. Um, so that's the other NRA. And on Friday, their trade magazine, which is called Nation's Restaurant News, published an article, the title of which was, the pandemic is forcing the industry to rethink compensation and tipped wages. That was whoa <laughs> extraordinary <laughs> because we've been talking to lots of independent restaurant owners who are willing to change their minds but for the nra's trade magazine to say that and to put and they actually cited our research and said maybe it's time for a rethinking and, and a change on these issues it just means there's a new openness to push on and we should do it together so i would say my question is here here free to talk <laughs> <laughs> let's talk but I'm, I'm thinking also there are probably some companies that you would like to um, really press on who are supplying schools lunches. And I would like to help you press on them. Thank you so much. That'd be amazing. Uh, completely. Yeah, that'd be amazing, Alice. Thank you. Yes. I keep thinking about this moment uh, where the NBA, the National Basketball Association, came together, owners, mm. coaches, players in this moment of social justice in this unfathomable time and moved the needle so deeply and did so much public education and now are going to open some stadiums as voting arenas and I'm thinking that you two are in the vanguard. You're going to be the NBA of food. Doc <laughs> River, Doc sure. Waters, and and just like Not that was so actually much. initiated by the WNBA. This is going to be initiated by women in our industry too. Yeah. <laughs> it was ever thus. I, I want to thank both Saru and Alice for joining us today. We hope you'll stay with Berkeley Unbound at five o'clock, Congresswoman Barbara Lee and the Dean of the Berkeley School of Law, speaking of UC Berkeley, Erwin Chemerinsky, will, will be having the final conversation of the day. And you know that's going to be a juicy one. 
I'm Davia Nelson of the Kitchen Sisters. I want to thank you all for joining us in the Zoom room and for joining the Bay Area Book Festival Unbound. Stay safe, stay steady, and make your vote count. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.